All right, I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, December 2nd, uh, 2019 Land Use Transportation Committee to order. And uh, our first order of business is public comment, and I have seen none, and I see no one in the, from the public, so we are going to move right ahead. Okay, next is committee business, and uh, first top topic of business is uh, the approval of minutes from the November 4th, 2019 meeting. Do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move approval of the November 2019, November 4th, 2019 Land Use and Transportation Committee meeting minutes. Second. All right. Motion is second. Do I have any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries unanimously. It's great. Liam, I, it's all you. All right. We can talk about the uh, North Lake uh, Amenity District. Yeah. Okay. The We're all done. We're getting there. Okay. Well, I tell you. A lot of work on this one. Uh, yes, we are getting to the finish line, though. <laughs> okay, all right, you promise. You'll only see me a few more times in the, in the new year. All right. Good evening, Deputy Mayor Honda, Committee Chair Copang, Council Members. Uh, tonight, I am discussing the resolution creating an advisory committee for the new North Lake Management District, and secondarily, uh, an ordinance on assessment. The policy question for you this evening is, should council approve a resolution creating an advisory committee for the North Lake Management District Number 2 and establishing the duties thereof? So the renewal process to date, I want you to go through this. Again, I've been here pretty much all year, as you guys well know. So we are getting to the close, however. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, again, the LMD benefits, we've kind of gone through this before, basically a process and structure. Tonight we're discussing establishing that representation through an advisory committee. So the advisory committee representation as written through RCW code and in the resolution is uh, that it is uh, a committee that is representative of the property owners around the lake in question. Uh, so there are single family residential properties, uh, the deeded access vacant properties, the former properties uh, or properties formerly known as the Weyerhaeuser uh, properties, and then the Department of Fish and Wildlife public access area. Uh, so the current structure is that there are seven members, uh, five that are residential property owners, uh, so kind of that whole eastern portion of the lake, one representing the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and one representing the former Weyerhaeuser properties. Uh, and then there is staff support for um, all the meeting coordination and uh, basically fulfilling the work plan of the advisory committee and lake management district. Uh, so the terms are two years. However, uh, within this resolution establishing the advisory committee, uh, the first members will be appointed as follows. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife representative and two of the residential single family uh, property owners will serve for three year terms and then the remaining four members will serve two year terms. So this will protect against uh, basically all of the committee members potentially leaving at the end of a two year term and will create more consistency in the committee for uh, all the authority therein. And vacant single family property owners shall not serve more than two terms, but all others um, may serve more than two terms consecutively. So again, the purpose of the advisory committee is to uh, basically develop and implement the work plan throughout each year of the Lake Management Districts uh, being in. And so the first of those is to develop the work plan. Uh, basically, so here's the draft 2020 budget that the North Lake Management District Advisory Committee put together um, at our Q4 meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, so just roughly over 17,000. This is about what it looks like. So it's each task. Um, they set about a, a figure each year, and then we go through uh, throughout the year with quarterly meetings to discuss how we are meeting those work plan goals. So implementing the work plan looks like aquatic vegetation management, water quality monitoring, and education outreach primarily. There's also a public education component that we uh, do through quarterly newsletters, as well as uh, web page links, annual report, and a, uh, an annual meeting. Um, so the annual report, a little bit more on that, is basically what is the work plan, how have we implemented it, and uh, also looking forward to it as to future goals. And then the public meeting uh, for the district, annually we hold a barbecue at Steel Lake Park. 
and we roughly get about 30 to 40 uh, district property owners between Seal Lake and North Lake. Uh, it's always a great showing. And so the advisory committee appointment following the approval of this resolution, letters will be sent to all property owners within the Lake Management District boundaries um, for basically soliciting applications for the advisory committee. Uh, then staff will review those applications probably in February or March, uh, and then we'll bring the applicants before council for appointment. So again, next steps uh, would be adoption of the resolution, uh, then going through the appointment of that advise, uh, advisory committee, and, uh, and then we begin assessment collection through King County, so we're just about there. The options before you are to, one, approve the proposed resolution creating an advisory committee, and two, do not approve the proposed resolution and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends option one. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Now, I, I, maybe I missed it, um, but is uh, the uh, IRG going to be on the board? Yes, there will still be one uh, one representative that is representing the properties. It's written into the resolution properties formerly known as Weyerhaeuser because IRG recently changed names. Um, and so yes, because it is wanting to be representative of the properties, and as you can see, Weyerhaeuser is quite a large yep. portion of that. So. Okay. So, so they are being represented. Um, and uh, Dana Ostensen did actually um, accept all the 2020 calendar meeting invites, so hopefully Got they will be joined via conference call in right. the future. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Committee members, any questions? All right. Uh, your motion, then. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed resolution to the January 7, 2020, consent agenda for approval. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carried unanimously. Leah, you're still there. I'm still here. I know. A continuation of the same presentation. So now we are discussing the ordinance on delinquent assessments. So recently, uh, or the policy question before you, formally, uh, should council adopt an ordinance establishing the time of payment interest and penalties to be imposed on delinquent annual special assessments for the North Lake Management District number two. As you may recall, last month uh, at the November 5th council meeting, uh, we had a public hearing on the assessments and a resolution that was passed that confirmed and approved the special assessment role uh, for each of the property owners within the LMD boundary. Um, this was required by RCW code, just basically if hear any objections, there were none. Um, and so basically the final step in this kind of, uh, the financial piece is to uh, have an ordinance on delinquent assessments. So if property owners do not pay their assessments, this basically says what happens next. Uh, so again, these uh, assessments are built annually. They're based on the property type, um, and they do allow for that continuous funding mechanism. So it is important that each property owner does pay each year. Also, because there are various penalties involved, um, so if they do not pay by the deadline of May 10th, there is a 1% interest per month on that principal payment. There is also a penalty of 5% of the assessment. That is the minimum allowed by our CW code. And uh, even after one year of non-payment, there is an automatic lien against the property that is then lifted uh, when payment occurs. But after three years of non-payment, King County may enter into a foreclosure process for unpaid uh, charges. And so the next steps here are basically that if uh, you forward the ordinance to the city council meeting on January 7th, um, and then it would go to a second reading January 21st, uh, and then basically this is the end of the steps necessary for the assessment piece, and we would be able to begin assessment collection through King County in April. So the options considered for you are to, one, forward the proposed ordinance to first reading at the January 7th, 2020 City Council meeting, or two, do not uh, adopt the proposed ordinance and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends option one. Uh, and I'm happy to hear any questions. Uh, committee members, any questions? Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, I, I served for several years, years on our homeowners board, and we put a lien on a property for non payment of dues. We had the homeowner, that was part of the homeowner's responsibility, was to pay for that. 
So if a lien is put on a property for this, who pays for the legal work uh, for the lien to be done? Yes, that, that is actually all through King County. So King, King County pays for it, it's not pays for that. Mm -hmm. It isn't transferred, transferred to the property owner? It is not, um, to my knowledge, that, that is all through King County. County. Has, Has there ever been a property that didn't pay that had a lien on their property? Uh, there, there are several, several properties at both Steel Lake and North Lake that generally go to the two-year mark. Um, we send two rounds of reminder letters throughout the year um, for payment. Those generally work. Um, and I have uh, never seen King County go through the foreclosure process on either one. We currently have one uh, individual on North Lake who has not paid for three years now. So if not paid by then May 10th of 2020, then King, King County, County would have, have the option. And, and so, so I'd, I'd like, like to stress they have the option of entering into the foreclosure process. Obviously, that is a costly process, so it's not necessarily, it's up to them if they want to enter into that or not. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sure. Absolutely. Probably not cost effective for the Probably not cost effective for one lonely yeah. homeowner at North Lake, but, um, but yes. Okay, very good, Leah. Um, I, I have one more question. Oh, sure. Uh, so, so if the property owner doesn't pay the, the dues and it goes for several years, if the property owner were to sell the property, there isn't is there anything, anything on the property that would have to be handled before the sale could be final? There would be. They would have to pay those. And actually, that has been occurring at some of the properties on both Steel Lake and North Lake is where when a property is sold, we're like, oh, gosh, we got a huge amount of assessments from one property. And it's probably because they had not paid for the previous owner, and the new owner does have to pay those, um, those charges, those assessments. Um, before being able to finalize the purchase of that home. Which is what a lien would do. So. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's let's any further questions. Did I a motion? I move forward, forward the proposed ordinance, ordinance to first reading on January 7th, 2020. Second. Okay. Uh, a motion to second. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. okay. Motion carried unanimously. All, all right, right Leah. Leah. Thank you. It. <laughs> well, happy right. holidays to you all. I'll see you again in January. January. Well, <laughs> well, you'll see us. Uh, well, that's, that's right. right. January's, January's when we'll do that for the, the uh, you know, you're off the hook for the rest of December. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. Easy, easy. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. Christy Mullen is our senior <laughs> capital engineer. We're going to talk about uh, the Military Road South United Compact Roundabout and Project Acceptance. Yes, we've got a project being closed, closed out. out. All right. Okay. So the policy question for you tonight is, should the council accept that the Military Road South and South 298 Street Compact Roundabout Project is complete? And just a little background on the project. Um, we constructed a compact roundabout at the intersection of Fuller Mount Center Island. Also provided some sidewalks and the ADA ramps and illumination on the uh, corners. Here is a photo of the new roundabout and some before and after photos. So here on the left, you can see we originally just had the lanes going straight through our military. Now we have the splitter islands in the roundabout there. This is looking north. Here's from 298 looking east. Um, this area with all the grass, that's a single family residence that just had um, Drainage ditches in front of their property before, so now there's enclosed storm drain there and the sidewalk and the retaining wall. And this is on 298 looking west. So again, this is from the a residential neighborhood chip that's on the east side of the intersection looking out there at the roundabout. So the approved construction contract amount was $817,000 plus or minus. Um, the final construction contract amount was a little over $711,000. Um, so we were below budget by $105,000. Um, and then I just have some information down there. So on the original budget that was approved when we uh, awarded the bid, um, so we have a little bit there and then the 10% contingency. So um, with our final amount of 711, we are coming in less than what the little bid was. Didn't have to use any of the contingency. Um, so, so the options for consideration, consideration are 
One, to authorize final acceptance of the Military 298 Compact Roundabout Project constructed by Active Construction in the amount of $711,527.20 is complete. And option number two is do not authorize final acceptance and provide directions to staff. The Mayor's recommendation is to forward option one to the January 7th consent agenda for approval. And any questions? Thank you, Christine. Um, committee members, any questions? questions? Um, this, this question, question might be for EJ, but how does the um, I-976 impact future projects that are on, um, already been considered or potentially considered? Um, so for this project, it does not impact. Um, and this project is not used for those funds. The only projects that the city has been aware, made aware of is as part of the legislative um, process last year, the city was awarded a $300,000 grant associated with 314th um, between Pete on Mike Bauer and 23rd. So WatchDot formally provided us notice that that was on hold and we could not obligate or spend that money um, until they either release the hold or the money goes away. Um, so that is an unknown right now, but that is the only project that, as of the second, we are aware of. Um, the overarching impact of I-76 is a lot larger than the local projects. Um, so I think WatchDot's published some information on that, Sound Transit has published that, and then it's obviously going through a court process as well. Um, so I mean, how that all plays out is a little yet to be seen. Okay. Um, I, you, you sent, sent us an email, email about that, that it did. right? Yeah. yeah. So, so my, my question was really around other roundabouts, because um, my, my neighborhood, neighborhood is looking for one, you know, to be built, and I think I've mentioned that to you. Correct. And so um, is, is, this, is, is that, that going to impact it at all, or no. is, it, is it just a normal process, considering how long it's So the one um, down near your neighborhood, we went to the, that's actually part of the Neighborhood Traffic Safety Program, which is funded um, at a level of $50,000 per year out of mm -hmm. um, out of a city revenue, you know, it uses different resources, but it's, it's not money we receive from WashDOT um, or the state. And um, when we went out to bid for that, plus or minus a year ago, or eight months ago, um, our bids that we received, we only received one bid, and the bid that we received was more than double the cost of what it had been prior to that. Um, so we brought to council a recommendation to reject that bid and go out for bids again in January of 2020. Um, so we are on track to do that, and to go out um, in January with a new request for bids um, and then rebid that NTS program, which will actually be two years worth of construction. That roundabout is project, so I'm going from memory here, it's either one or two on the list um, that will uh, be constructed as soon as we have an awarded contract. So. Late, late spring or early summer, summer depending on weather. Sure. All right. Uh, any additional questions regarding oh, the Deputy Mayor Honda? Is it regarding Yes. Okay. I have two questions. One, um, the remaining money goes back to what fund and that wasn't spent on this project? And um, did this roundabout do what we wanted it to do? And are the neighbors that live around it happy? Yes, when, when it first came in, in many, many of us got a lot of emails from folks over there. there. Yeah. 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 Um, EJ or Desiree might be best to discuss where, where the money is going to. It is, yeah, so this is restricted funding that stays within the streets fund, um, stays within the capital program. Um, so it'll go back within the capital streets program. There's a, it's classified as unallocated capital, um, which is where revenue from projects goes and then um, as part of a future project we'll bring back to council being able to reallocate that money into whichever projects either has a need or the next project that's not funded yet um and then you're rolling it forward correct yeah and then i'm sorry your second question so did the roundabout do what we wanted it to do um, so it has um, anecdotally from what we've seen and what we've heard from police, yes. 
Um, we are, it's still in its infancy, so we don't really have enough data yet to be able to scientifically answer that question yet. Um, but from what we have seen so far, yeah, so it's reduced speeds, it's reduced to date collisions at that intersection. Um, but it typically takes 12 months of collecting data before we can really answer that. We're not, we're not out there yet. Has it reduced the amount of traffic on the road? It has made um, traffic flow better and it has improved the safety of the intersection. It has not reduced the count of cars that go through that intersection, nor was it intended to. Okay, thank you. And I will say that I got a lot of phone calls on this project during construction just because we had it open for a long time in the winter and people weren't happy with that. I actually have received a couple phone calls post construction with people saying, thank you, we appreciate it, which we don't always get those phone calls. I think I've had one person call to still complain about it, but um, I think it's one of those things where we don't have the information to know um, that it has fully addressed all of the traffic concerns, but I explained that to them that it does take about a year to get that information to do the analysis. Thank you for the additional explanations. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move the forward option one to the January 7, 2020 City Council Consent Agenda for approval. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we'll okay. 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 thank you. John Cole. We're going to hear next about the uh, joint structure agreement between the Federal Way and Puget Sound Energy. Energy. Sounds, Sounds like a good partnership. We hope, hope so. so. Um, So, Chair Kopang, community members, members council, council members, members, my name is John Cole. I'm the Capital, Capital Projects uh, Engineer, the City of Federal Way, and here to present uh, a joint construction agreement with uh, Puget Sound Energy uh, to Committee. Um, question, uh, policy question I'm bringing for you today is, um, should Council authorize the Mayor to execute the joint construction agreement between the City of Federal Way and Puget Sound Energy for the 2020 Asphalt Overlay Program? Um, the location um, that uh, we're interested in um, joining in this agreement with is on P.P. on Rec Bar. Um, from just uh, approximately adjacent to uh, Iver Seafood north to 316th, uh, South 316th Street. Uh, Puget Sound Energy uh, requested the city enter into a joint construction agreement for the overlay of uh, this portion of Pete Brown and Rec Bar Way due to a gas main, DuPont gas main replacement as part of our 2020 asphalt overlay program. A joint construction agreement is being pursued in an effort to reduce both cost and an extended public disruption in the area. Um, an estimated cost of the joint construction agreement, um, based on our estimates, would be about $381,080.60. Uh, the actual reimbursement cost will be based on um, the bid amounts at the time and the select contractor. Um, options before the committee are authorized the mayor to execute the joint construction agreement between the city of Federal Way and Puget Sound Energy for the overlay of a portion of PP on Red Bar, or option two, do not authorize the mayor to execute the joint construction agreement um, and provide direction to the staff. Uh, the mayor recommends supporting option one uh, to the uh, January fourth community meeting and uh, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, John. Now, now as, as I understand it, um, this, this will both be a cost savings doing this, this and it'll actually improve the, 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 the net, net result of the quality of the road as a whole will be better as a result of doing this all at the same time. time. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. They uh, they had the uh, DuPont gas, gas main is common in the city, um, the recall, so they're digging them up and uh, replacing them. Just happened to be that it coincided with our overlay. Um, it made sense to uh, continue on um, and go into uh, agreement with them on this because it was a substantial portion of what we were going to overlay anyways. Good, good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
committee members, members any questions? questions? Okay. Uh, just, just a quick, quick clarification as far as where the money, money comes from and like timeline of reimbursement once the project's complete. Sure. Um, where the money comes from would be straight from PSE uh, for this portion. Like I said, just from adjacent to divers up to halfway through 316 is what they disrupted it, what we're requiring to repair. Um, and as far as the, uh, the second, second question, question, I'm sorry, sorry. Reimbursement. 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 Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure how reimbursement works. works. So, so PSC, we've, we've done, done this a couple, couple of times with PSC over the last couple of years. Um, typically, we need to receive the invoices from the contractor, and then we review them, sign off on them, and then we send them to PSC, and we get payment 30, 45 days later. Um, it's, it's a small enough amount, amount within the overall uh, overlay fund account um, that, that we can pay, pay the contractor, contractor and then we essentially reimburse ourselves out of, you know, when we receive their payment. Oh, thank you. Um, there is a construction site on that piece of property I mean, on that road. Yes. yes. Are they paying any traffic impact fees that would go into this project? We actually looked at several different things. Um, um, Vantage, I believe, is the construction, the, the project name. Uh, it's the assisted living center adjacent to the park. Cross street from the park. park. Um, they're, they're doing, doing their frontage improvements, improvements required um, with, with their improvements, um, which include, I believe, one, one two wheelchair ramp, ramp uh, new sidewalks, sidewalks gutter, gutter, curb, gutter, gutter um, whatnot. whatnot. But uh, this, this is independent of that. It was considered when looking at the whole project. There was another small patch that uh, Lake Haven was responsible, responsible down uh, for down, down at 320 at the PPR as well. well. So um, this, this was isolated just, just for PSE's portion. Okay. And they were, they were adamant. That <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions? Hearing none, I have a motion. I move to forward option one to the January 7, 2020 consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay, there's a motion, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion well, carried unanimously. All right. John, you can go home. Jeff, we've got you for two. The first one is the 2018 uh, NHS Preservation Project Final Acceptance. Good evening, Chair Copang, committee members, council members. My name is Jeff Han. I'm the Capital Engineer for the City of Ottawa, Way, and I'm presenting the 2018 NHS Preservation Project for the final acceptance. Prior to release of the retainers on a public works construction project, the City Council must accept the work as complete to meet um, State Department of Revenue and State Department of Labor and Industries requirements. The 2018 NHS Preservation Project contract with Mines Resources is complete. The final construction contract amount is $2,523,274. This is a $277,000 below the $2.8 million budget that was approved by the City Council on June 19, 2018. The options before committees are, one, authorize the final acceptance of a 2018 NHS preservation project constructed by Mines Resources in the amount of $2.5 million as complete. Or two, do not authorize final acceptance of the completed 2018 NHS preservation project constructed by Mines Resources as complete and provide direction to staff. Uh, the main recommends forwarding option one to January 7th 2020 City Council Consent Agenda for approval. Uh, staff is available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the presentation. Any questions for the committee members? Council members? No? Hearing none? You get another easy. Have a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 7, 2020 Consent Agenda for approval. Have a second? Second. All right. Um, 
Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Well, carried Aye. unanimously. All right, Jeff. Number two is the 2018 Asphalt Overlay <laughs> Project Final Acceptance. Uh, Chair Kopang, committee members, at this time I'm presenting the 2019 Asphalt Overlay Project from Final Acceptance to the committee. Prior to release of retainers on a public works construction project, the city council member accept the work as complete to meet state department of revenue and state department of labor and industries requirements. The 2019 the final construction contract amount is one million four hundred twenty thousand eighty-two dollars. This is thirty-six thousand dollars below the one point four million dollars budget that was approved by the City Council on March 19, 2019. Uh, the options before committees are, one, authorized final acceptance of the 2019 Astro Overlay Project constructed by Mines Resources in the amount of $1.4 million as complete, or two, do not authorize final acceptance of the 2019 Astro Overlay Project constructed by Mines Resources as complete and provide uh, directions to staff. Uh, the mayor recommends forwarding option one to the January 7th, 2020 city council consent agenda for approval. And staff is available for any questions you may have. Jeff, thank you. Um, committee members, any questions? <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to recognize uh, the good work that uh, staff did um, because both of this project that you presented today um, the saving was uh, about three hundred dollars below the, the, the budget yeah. which is uh, really good so thank you yeah. I think uh, adding the uh, compact roundabout it's uh, four hundred and eighteen thousand seven hundred ninety one dollars so not bad so good thank you and that's uh, that's not you guys sandbagging the numbers. That's you guys managing the project after they've been bid. So thank you. It's Thanks. good work for the staff. So anyway, um, uh, any additional questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 7th, 2020 consent agenda for approval. Second. All right. Uh, your motion is second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries unanimously. Jeff, thank you. Aye, thank you. All right, so next we have Kent Smith. And Kent, you're going to be talking about the 2019 Storm Pipe Repair Phase 1 Project Acceptance. Yes. Okay. Good evening, uh, uh, Chair Copang, committee members, council members. Uh, I'm presenting the 2019 Storm Pipe Repair Project Phase 1 uh, Final Acceptance. So the pause question is, should City Council accept the 2019 Storm Pipe Repair Project uh, constructed by North Bend Sewer Service as complete? And just a little background, there's three locations for storm pipe repair. Uh, total of three pipes were rehabilitated, uh, two fully replaced pipe segments and one partial replacement. Um, as Jeff said earlier, prior to release of the Britannia Public Works Construction Project, um, the City Council must accept the work as complete to meet State Labor and uh, Department of Revenue and State Department of Labor and Industries requirements. Uh, the 2019 Storm Pipe Repair Project is complete. Uh, the final construction contract amount is 87,251.92, which is $968.08 below the 88,220, uh, including construction construction contingency budget. It was approved. Uh, by City Council on June 18, 2019. Um, this is the acceptance construction is complete and there are no additional funds proposed to be spent as part of this agenda. And then the option considered authorized final acceptance of the 2019 storm pipe repair phase one constructed by Nordman Sewer Service LLC in the amount of 87,251.92 is complete or two, do not authorize and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends forwarding option one to the January 7, 2020 City Council Consent General for approval. Any questions? Kent, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, committee members, any questions? All right. Hearing none, to have a motion. 
Mr. Chair, before I make the motion again, I want to recognize the staff work on this. Uh, this is another project that came in um, at about 10 percent below cost, so below, below the budget. So thank you. thank you. Good work. Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 7th, 2020 consent agenda for approval. Second. All right. Um, hearing motion is second. Do I have any further, discuss any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you, Kent. And then uh, Teresa Thurlow will go ahead and talk about the 2020-2021 Surface Water Management Vector Services and Drainage Infrastructure Maintenance Authorization to bid. All right. That's a mouthful. Let's see. We had a tall guy there. <laughs> Okay, good evening, um, Community Chair Copang, Deputy Mayor Honda, Council members, engaged members of the public. Um, I'm here to present the 2020-2021 Surface Water Maintenance and Vector Services Contract Authorization to Bid and the policy question before you tonight. Should City Council authorize SWIM staff to bid the proposed 2021 Surface Water Maintenance and Services Contract and return to LUTC and Council for authorization to award the contract within the available project budget to the lowest responsive responsible bidder. So a little bit of background, um, vectoring out of the catch basins of pipes and other things within the city is something that's required under our um, MPDS permit. And uh, this is an inventory of some of the um, structures that do receive those services. Um, and in fact, uh, draw your attention, uh, almost 13,000 catch basins is actually a lot of catch basins, um, even compared to uh, area cities. And then uh, we do work on ponds. Um, that's a manhole right there. Um, various potholing for structures. Um, we have muck that we occasionally have to get rid of. And um, this is what it looks like when it's decanted into a very lovely decant center, which I hope one day to have. Um, anyway, the contract background, we did award a contract uh, November of last year uh, to Action Services contract. And um, it was for one year with an uh, option to extend it. However, I don't recommend that we um, extend that contract. The um, contract amount will be expended by March of this year. And we are seeking to go out for a new uh, request for bids um, for this service for our city. The um, maintenance and service contract, uh, the estimated cost for next year is $245,000. Um, our approved budget and the 19-2020 budget is $229,434, uh, which does give us a shortfall of a little over $15,000. However, under the June CPI of 2.3%, um, there will be an increase in the SWIM revenue charge next year, resulting in a revenue increase of $94,993. So we would, um, if bids do come in at the engineer's estimate, we would uh, be able to cover that shortfall with the um, incoming revenue. The options uh, before you tonight are to authorize SWIM staff to bid the proposed 2020-2021 surface water maintenance and vector services contract and return to LUTC and council for authorization to award the contract within the available project budget to the lowest responsive responsible bidder. Do not authorize SWIM staff to bid the project and provide direction to staff. And the mayor um, recommends option one and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Teresa. Um, committee members, any questions? All right, hearing none, do I have a motion? I move to forward option one to the January 7th, 2020 consent agenda for approval. Second. All right, um, hearing motion is second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, Bill Vadino. We have two presentations, both are information, um, one of which may go to the uh, council one okay. or may just be discussed here further. So the first is the panhandling signage discussion and uh, obviously the second is the report on aircraft issues. So we'll go ahead and start with the panhandling. Yeah, here we go. 
So the um, I've been asked to do research on. Oh, this is the wrong one. I'm sorry. Hit the wrong one. Sorry about that. So some cities have signage that discourage panhandling. Okay, and, and I've done some initial research. Uh, as this continues, we'll be able to do, do a lot more, but we've been checking with some cities. But I wanted to give you uh, an overview. Um, the, the cities that we know for sure are engaged in this are, are uh, Lakewood. This is what the chair and other people knew about. And they have 18 signs since May 2018. Kennewick has 27 <coughs> signs since summer 2018. Walla Walla has 10 signs, College Place since September. And then Spokane has been doing parking meters where you put the change in the parking meters instead. So um, there's many different kinds of signage examples. Uh, the one on the left is the city of Lakewoods. And I think this is pretty much a template. I see these all over the country when I do a scan. Um, these other two, one's from Scottsdale and the other one's from Dublin, it's um, less of the no with the slash and more of the it's okay or say no. And there's a better way to give. Hold on a second here. So in, in talking with um, Public Works, uh, I'm going to show you a map in a second. 20 signs would be approximately $10,000. And $500 each includes the sign and the installation by King County. And then, of course, um, the experience with cities, even though I want to document this better for you, is you know they are prone to be tagged and taken down and vandalized. So there'll be some replacement needed as well, too. So if we were to do this uh, in, in consultation with Public Works, these are the locations. I know the map's a little bit small, but starting from the north, uh, the turn at the Shell Station, Pack Highway, and Dash, South uh, Dash Point Way. Thought I had a pointer here for a second. And then, of course, Pack Highway at uh, South 320th, four signs there. Uh, South 320th and 23rd Avenue South, two signs there as you're entering from I-5 to the heading west. Uh, Pack Highway and 15th Avenue South, one sign, and that's as you're heading down, that's uh, near uh, Pattison's, heading uh, south towards uh, the Walmart. And then we go to Pack Highway and South 348th, very popular intersection, and then the next one west of that, which is Pack Highway and 16th Avenue South. And then we move west over to Southwest Campus Drive and um, 21st Avenue Southeast. And uh, initially, uh, I talked to um, the people of Lakewood, and uh, they feel that since the 18 signs were uh, installed in May 2018, there was a drop-off in panhandling. Not a total drop-off, but a drop-off. So they, they see significant results. I've got calls out trying to figure out what the situation's been in the other cities. Then, of course, that's, that's the pro. The con is you'll see at these cities and other places editorials about, you know, this just stigmatizes people and even members are, of our community development team believes it sends a message to panhandlers, but it also sends a, a message to those who are in need as well, too. So, so um, as you saw in your packet, the mayor's recommendation is not to implement. Uh, concerned about it sends a harsh and negative message to residents who live here that basically we've got panhandling. Those who work in the city will see that, whether they're there or not. Uh, it could be uh, have a chilling effect on businesses that would potentially build or relocate, relocate to the city as well as tourists. And uh, he's concerned that uh, it would insult those who know better. I th if they're going to give, they're going to give. If they're not, they're not. And he believes our city is better than this, and we should take this money and help the homeless with it. So, so discussion and questions, and where else would you like me to take the trail? Because this is a, a deep subject that deserves more research. But that's what I've been able to put together with you, for you. Okay, appreciate the presentation. Um, the committee members, do you guys have any questions or comments or? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't mind if you scrolled back so we could hear the mayor's objections again. Um, <laughs> Because I, I don't know. Would it go one more? One more? Yeah. Um, I want to make sure. 
committee members okay. have those in hand. Um, Councilmember Johnson, you want to start? Or? Sure. Uh, thanks, Bill, for providing the information and having a, I guess, a different degree of, of cities that have these signs. Um, my question is on the locations, because um, as we know, um, there's panhandlers in a lot of the same locations. How, how did we kind of gather data around these specific locations um, and, and why they would generate the most or yield the most uh, return in terms of having a sign there? So uh, I was working with uh, EJ's team at Public Works, okay. and based on observation, this is this is where they see the frequent flyers. Okay, and those those Perfect. were there. Thank you. And then my other question is just around um, some of the signs mentioned. You know, giving to other organizations. Do we have a list of those organizations in Federal Way that people could give to, or are there examples of signs where those organizations are listed on the signs? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to go more deeply into that and we'll in our next presentation. In other cities, they will have a, a website that you could donate to. And at that website, it will either go into a fund that's allocated or you could pick what organizations the money could go to. So it's a multi-layer thing. Either you're on your own or here's a website to go to, but then someone's going to administer it. Or here's a way like when we uh, donate to the United Way and we can check off on the website and on the forum and just basically have our money targeted as well too. So, but no, we could we could put together a list of organizations and people could either choose or it could be divided up fairly even though we'd have to figure out how that would come up with the formula. Yeah, that would be great because I think a, a lot of folks probably know about organizations within the region or the county, but Federal Way specific, helping people in Federal Way, I'm not sure if there's a general understanding of what those organizations are or how to Okay. Donate. Mm -hmm. Chair Copang, could I jump in for one second yes. on that issue? Um, before we distributed or gave any list of any organizations that would potentially, where the money would potentially go to, we'd want to look into that a little bit further to make sure that we're not crossing any barriers with the city endorsing any specific charities sure. or moving forward with that. So keep that in mind that this will would all require further research before implementing any policy change. But I, I think uh, it would be easy enough for us to uh, put that into a fund and then have human services uh, vet different organizations and then move it through the council um, committee process to the council as we would with anything, correct? I mean, I don't see that as a high hurdle. I think that's just procedurally it's something that we would just need to achieve. Would you say that question one more time? Yeah, I apologize. I, I, don't, I, I understand what you're saying about the fact that we don't necessarily want to endorse specific organizations, but we have a number of organizations we already work with uh, that are funded in part through the Human Services Committee vetting process and approved by the council. Um, so any additional organizations um, would need to go through that process as well. Um, but again, we have procedures in place to accommodate the additional revenue that could come from, an or from a program like this. Potentially. Yes. Potentially have it, or we do have I, it? I would want to make sure and check with human services before speaking for them in this situation. Okay. All right. Okay. I think we've got a pretty robust process there. So that's okay. Appreciate that, Mark, but I also understand your caution. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I do, you know, I think that that's an obvious point here. Um, Public Works was able to identify locations where signs could be useful based on the fact that there are people advertising their need for funding as panhandlers mm -hmm. there on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a sign that says there were panhandlers here, potentially, or there are panhandlers there, mm -hmm. I don't know which message is, 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 is worse, really. I think that mm -hmm. in the end, we, we want to make sure that people have opportunity to, to get the help they need. Mm -hmm. um, but. I think that we've seen that um, that panhandling being rewarded, panhandling continues to be rewarded. We're going to continue to have it, and if the citizens of Federal Way want it, then I guess we'll continue to have it, whether there are signs or not. Because I certainly am not. I wouldn't propose that we, in any way, say you can't, because they can. Um, so I guess I just don't want to. I don't want to dance around this too much. Um, I'm concerned that the mayor is re raising some some concerns that, while they're valid, um, on on one side, 
are, are not valid from the standpoint that there are panhandlers in these locations already. So I guess the question is, and something we'd like to hear, I've heard from the community, and maybe I haven't heard from enough people in the community, but heard enough from them that I thought it was worthwhile for us to at least have this discussion. Um, I think that it would also be good for us to really get a little bit more information on, on the other cities mm -hmm. and um, what net, the net effects of their policy has been. I think we don't have to lead the way, um, but we can certainly, um, and we're not leading the way. Um, we certainly can, can benefit from their experiences. Um, but uh, I think that it's, there's an assumption that I think a lot of people make, um, some on the council here, and I hate, to, I'm not speaking for the council I say this, but I think people assume that everybody understands that there are organizations they can give to. Um, and I can tell you from somebody that was in the city for a long time, I wasn't paying attention to where I could give money for a long time. You know, then I got engaged over 10 years ago and figured it out. But again, it's about awareness. <coughs> and if we can create awareness that leads people to understand that there are, there are organizations that they can give to um, that can help people that are in the plight of being homeless all the time. Um, so it could be a win-win. So anyway, um, Councilmember Tran, any thoughts? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Um, I mean, I can, I can live either way, having the size or not having the size. But one thing I do object is to use the tax dollars to pay for the size. If we are going to um, have those size made, I would prefer the city to partnership with private businesses or individual and have those people pay for the sign instead of using the tax dollars to pay for those sign. Okay. I have some Any questions. Oh, Council, Thank Deputy you. Mayor Honda. I have a lot of concerns with uh, putting signs up that So the signs would encourage uh, folks not to give money or food or whatever to uh, those who are panhandling. Um, yet there's not, if someone were to do that, there's not a penalty to, to doing that. And I don't want to make a penalty to, for doing that. Yeah. Um, I think $10,000 for doing this is a lot of money that we don't have right now. And I would be concerned of where that money come, would come out of. I'm almost guessing that it would come out of our council budget because this is a council-driven initiative. And um, <clears throat> we don't have the money in our council budget to do it right now. I'm also concerned that it's not going to change behavior. And the reason I say that is those who stop and give money to, to those who are asking for money, it probably makes someone feel good that they're helping somebody. And a sign isn't going to stop them from doing that. So I, I'm not, I don't know that it, it would change behavior enough to make it worthwhile to do it. My other concern is that this is taking up staff time. And if we were to create a website that had organizations that could um, get the money instead of, you know, folks giving it to panhandlers, I would be very concerned that we would perhaps miss an organization that might be worthy of receiving funding from this and um, therefore cause some additional issues. And then, of course, we would need a staff member to monitor the, the donations and decide who would be getting the money and re make a recommendation to the council as to, to that. And I'm not sure that our staff has the time to do that. Do you know, Bill, the cities that have actually suggested organizations to give money to, how much money has been collected? No, that's something I still need to research. Because I, that would be really interesting to yeah. find out how much money had, has been given that way. And, and they, they will sometimes hand it over to a nonprofit, and so they take the responsibility for making sure that uh, everybody's represented. 
So okay. there's, there's many ways to do this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also concerned about the, um, the fact that we would probably have to re be replacing signs and it would be an ongoing cost to replace signs. I've talked to some council members in other cities that have these signs and they say that they're tagged or they're um, destroyed one way or another. So it would be an ongoing cost for us to, to do that and that, that, that could be expensive. So I have a lot of concerns with this, yeah. but I also, yeah. you know, I, I'd like to know if one, if staff, if we have a staff member who could monitor the program, if we had a program. I'd like to know if, how much money cities are getting, if they encourage folks to donate to an organization instead of to the panhandler, and if that really has stopped panhandling in the cities that have those signs. You know, we, it would be easy to stop panhandling if people just didn't give money because then folks would go away. Or when the weather gets really bad, folks go away. So, you know, it's, it's a tough, it, I know that it, it concerns people. Uh, it concerns me, especially when I see children out there with an adult. But I'm not sure that this would stop the panhandling that we have going on in federal way. Um, do you have any ideas on how to stop the panhandling in federal way? We could do public service announcements on Channel 21. These are organizations you could give to. Okay. We could do ads in the newspaper. These are organizations you can give to. The only way to stop panhandling is not to give them give panhandlers money. Okay. Um, so yeah. you know, we, we, we could do those kind of well. things. Yeah. So, but I am, you know, the the cost of this. I'd like to know where the cost would come from. Yeah, it's not going to come from the council budget. Well, it no, it will not come from the council. And budget. you know that it, by yes, how? Because we won't approve it. We'll find another way to do it. We're not going to take it out of the council budget. We don't do road signs from the council budget. We never have. We never will. That's ridiculous. Well, I I would like to make sure that it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. We would approve that. So. We're not going to. So it's not going to happen. Well, I would need to make sure yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the mayor can't demand that that's taken out of our budget. So unless the council approves it, it's not going to happen. I would just like to make sure. Okay. I think, yeah. So I've got, I've got a lot of notes for a future discussion yes. and research. I think it, this is not ready for prime time, even close. But sure. I think that uh, the other thing to discuss, too, is, and I, I you know, $10,000, I don't know. It's, if we want to talk about money, um, let's have some substance to that money. Uh, just a round number, that's, that's not enough information. So I like the, a little bit more than a round number. I also think that there's a way for us to scale this up. If we want to look at this as mm -hmm. a potential solution, mm -hmm. we could do it at one intersection and see if we do get any results that merit expanding it. We don't have to go to a full-blown, all-inclusive answer out of the box and find out it doesn't work and then go, why do we spend all this money? So, I mean, I think that, you know, in, in business, what you do is you'll do a test market. Mm -hmm. or you'll do, uh, do R&D and, and come up with a, an idea that, you know, that to, to implement a plan and it either works or it doesn't work. You either learn something from it or move forward or you don't do something. But I think there's enough people in our community that are concerned that we are sitting on our hands not doing anything and seeing a problem getting worse. So that's what I heard when I was campaigning. That's what I'm hearing. So I think that we do need to do something. Whether we take out ads in the newspaper, that's going to cost us money. And that goes away. That has an expiration date. As soon as that paper gets thrown away, that message is gone. Um, so um, as far as, as, uh, as, low, as organizations that would benefit from any funding, we already have a list of them. They're already, that with the human service is already giving them money. So um, I don't think there's any big breakthrough in uh, investigative research that needs to happen there either. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think we want, I, I feel like we're making this more difficult than it needs to be. That's my feeling at this point. And I don't want to, if we don't want to do it, that's fine. 
but let's not create artificial barriers to, to having a discussion about one potential way to, res to, to, to create a solution. That's, that would be my direction. Councilmember Tran. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to add that um, I do agree with the mayor uh, that uh, by having those size is, is give our city kind of a negative um, image. Um, I just came back from a six country trip in Asia and I can tell you that when I arrive at the airport if I see sign that warn me about something going on, um, I'll tend to be more careful and say, oh, do I really want to go there or go there? Um, so this sign, the same thing. I mean, you know, he point out that businesses, potential businesses want to ro locate, relocate to Federal may have a second thought because they may think that, oh, Federal is having this huge problem um, so yeah I, I, I do agree with him um, on, on, on those because I don't want people tourists coming to the city and, and see city with a negative image so I just want to add that chair Kobe can I clarify one thing yes so um, Public Works has been getting lots of credit, and I, I appreciate that from Bill on uh, coming up with locations. Um, but just to clarify, so the, the 20 signs were um, a collaborative effort between my staff as well as police department and where they see it, as well as some input from community development and where they've seen some of the outreach efforts occur. So that's where the locations came from. Okay. That list started at about 45 signs. Okay. and we said much of the same comments that have been heard here of yeah. slim it down sure. um so that's how we we cut it to 20 of the the highest ones that those three departments plus king county roads um has seen and that that's where that number came from the sign the pricing it's almost five hundred dollars per sign dead on so what it's just a matter of scaling that what or however that many that includes manufacturing the sign, buying the post, going out, putting the post on the ground, and bolting the post to it one time. It includes no maintenance. And, and that, uh, um, as far as uh, um, options, is that the only way to do it, or could we actually? That's the cheap way to do it. OK, we can't like put it on an existing? Um, largely at these intersections where they would go, no. There may be a couple of exceptions to that. Yeah. Um, and where there might be a little bit of cost savings that we frankly haven't looked at it at that level okay. um, but largely no it was assumed we would need a new post for each one okay so 500 per sign that's easy okay yeah. so so not a whole lot of research there it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. a guess it's done okay good <laughs> okay good appreciate that all right um Deputy Mayor thank you i think it's important when council is discussing new ideas and things that we'd like to do that it, we get input from all council members without having other council members get angry with what we say. I think it's important that all thoughts from all council members are considered. And um, I understand that this has been something that is talked about on Facebook quite a lot. I'm on Facebook with two other cities on their friends of, of whatever city it is. And these issues are not unique to Federal Way. They're, they're, they pretty much happen in other cities also. So I am concerned with spending $10,000 on this. I, I, I just don't know that that's a good use of $10,000 when we are in a year where we have watched every dime. And next year's going to be the same that we need to watch every dime. So, and I'm not sure that's going to change the behavior. So, um, but I, we do need to let every council member have input and we need to listen politely and not uh, be angry with what another council member might have to say. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Deputy Mayor Handa, I can assure you, is not angry. I'm a little bit passionate because I want to hear solutions. Um, I think that we need to create solutions. 
Um, and I'm just, I've heard roadblocks, and I think those roadblocks are important for us to consider, but I also think that we need to definitely look at being solution-minded too, and how do, how do we create a solution and not just say, no, we can't do this. Let's come up with other ideas. Um, I think it's very important for us to recognize that people are concerned about panhandling. So we do nothing and it continues, or we do something. Um, I'm open for trying this. I'm not saying this is the answer. I want, I want to make sure, though, that we have a good reasoned discussion and not create false barriers. And I think mentioning the council budget is a false barrier because we wouldn't approve that. That's all I was saying. So I apologize for the passion, but I want to make sure that we're looking at reasonable solutions and that we, we, we create a positive um, uh, way forward. And so anyway, that's it. Um, so I think at this point, um, I don't think that we can bring this back to land use. I know there's other council members. Uh, council member Moore certainly is very interested in this and uh, disappointed he's not here um, to weigh in, but that's okay. We'll have another chance. Yeah, well, so, well, we're going to bring yeah. it back with yes. more research, correct? Yes. yes. So we'll bring this back to uh, land use next, next month. Excellent. Okay, good. Excellent. And uh, um, appreciate it. And again, Councilmember Tran Johnson, Councilmember Honda, or Dwight Mayor Honda, I appreciate your input. Um, there's there's more discussion to be had on this. Thank you. Great. Okay. And now to the next item, if I can find it. Oops. Okay. So aircraft noise and issues update for this month. Um, as you're all very well aware, the Department of Commerce study continues, and what they're trying to do is get it completed so it can be presented to the legislature during the two-month session. So that's good news. Um, Chair Copang, you were at the um, meeting in Burien. They presented their um, preliminary results looking for impact or, or for uh, input on it. Um, I think the meeting may not have gone as, I think, I think there were citizens who were concerned and not quite sure if this was an independent group or not, and they are, and I think by the end, I mean, was that, was that your understanding too? It took a while for the people in the room to figure out that these people are actually there advocating and grabbing the research that's there. And as we've talked about before, it's more about harvesting and low-hanging fruit. There's no funding for new research, but it could recommend new research. So, and then um, council member Seth Dawson was there as well too, so and some other citizens. Then uh, as we talked about last time, as we're looking at the legislative agenda tomorrow, we'll be looking at the re reintroduction of moving the zone for sound packages over federal way. And so there's a strategy for that, not only, it's, it's about getting it into the Senate. When we talk tomorrow, you know, we've got it pretty much in the House. We just have to work with our senators in the area to get that across there because that's where on the night of um, they were signing bills, uh, it was just, it just didn't quite get, get, get done there. So, and then we also talked about the um, Legislative Commission about another airport that continues to meet and we'll have an update on that. And then you approved at the last meeting, the Council, the uh, letters to the FAA and the um, Congressional Delegation and so we'll, keeping, we'll be keeping you update on that, updated on that. And then um, with the SeaTac Airport Roundtable, you all received an email today uh, with what the other two airport committees came up with. And basically, um, the three cities are in the process of having the three mayors meet with uh, Port Commission President Stephanie Bowman. And as I shared with you folks this afternoon, Burien and Des Moines Airport Committees put together a list of items that, that are concerns. And I believe tonight the Burien Council is looking at that. So you all as council members have that list. So anything else you see or can affirm would be great. And then we'll let you know what they come up with. But to, uh, but to summarize, you know, those other cities would like to have the design work suspended, which is once that design work went forward without start in the cities knowing, they'd like that to be suspended um, sometimes there's some requests that have gone to start that haven't been necessarily um, responded to. There's talk of maybe having more electeds involved 
in whatever process there is, and there's the potential to maybe use the Highline Forum as the venue or, or a sub-venue. And then, as um, I probably didn't report, they had a facilitator for start, but it was hired by the port. It wasn't a neutral facilitator. So there's an idea of having a neutral facilitator that would make the judgment call on certain things. For instance, like uh, some people wanted the video recordings, <coughs> audio or video recordings of the meetings, and the facilitator thought about it and well, it was decided not to. But a lot of the cities would like to attend in absentia. Um, and then a co-equal agenda setting, uh, a lot more collaboration, a lot more involvement of electorate, electorates, and basically not to have start be just a checkbox for uh, engagement with the port, but also just seen as a collaboration to solve problems, especially with um, uh, what's going on with airport issues. So, but based on what you what you received this afternoon, I'm sure you're going to take a deeper dive. But is there anything else, especially the chair? You've been involved, uh, council member. Um, Sefa Dawson has been involved um, with Highline and, and those forums. Is there anything else? We could do this offline, but anything else you would see that would be important to bring up? I think you've got the list. Okay. Yeah. So no no missions or anything? Anything you can think of no, elsewhere? Think you got it. Okay. And and frankly, in our situation, we're we're standing by our two cities. And uh, which I think is a good thing. Yep. And then uh, the last thing to report, it happened last week. There was the court case of uh, Burien versus the FAA. And apparently now the Ninth Circuit has uh, directed the FAA to go back to the drawing board and consider um, impacts on cities. And the one that's cited, and I'll get you a map for next time, is called the Burien Turn, which, which turns, turns over Burien. We have our own turns as well, too. Mm -hmm. You know, as they as they turn past Marine Hills and head over, you know, Dash Point and all those cities, there's the effect of next gen. So um, this this may be positive for us as well too. So very good. But other than that, any questions? No. That's great. Any questions? Bill, thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, is there anything else that the committee would like to bring up for the good of the order? Uh, hearing none, um, so this meeting adjourned. The next LUTC meeting will be on Monday, January 6th at 5 p.m. right here in Council Chambers. And the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. The game is tied 7-7. Oh, you're watching. <laughs>